Thank you, Ruth. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's so good to see everyone. Uh, special thanks to the, uh, the commissioners and the University of Uves uh, Uvascula for hosting us. And uh, again, we're sorry we can't be there, but we're there in spirit with you. Um, and, and just real quickly, uh, I appreciate so much our tribute to our, our colleagues this morning, because for me, it reminded me of, of really the importance of this commission uh, in that we, we have uh, the opportunity to share these values uh, across borders, across language barriers. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a good reminder to me uh, to remember them in that spirit. So I'd like to speak to you today quick, quickly about uh, women in instru instrumental music education research. This, um, this uh, work was uh, done not just by me, but, but, but my colleagues, Mitchell Davis and Harry Price. Um, and uh, this actually is part of a larger uh, content analysis, but we thought we'd pull out issues of gender just to give you a, a look at this. Uh, what we looked at were two important journals in the United States, the Journal of Research and Music Education and the Bulletin of the Council for Research and Music Education. JRME began in 1953, the BCR, BCRME began in 1963, and we looked at every single article in instrumental music education in both those journals from, its, from their inception through 2019. And we're going to be adding 2020 uh, uh, shortly. Uh, the reason why we picked these uh, is because they are the longest standing journals of their sort in the United States. Their, uh, their impact uh, is, uh, is quite, uh, I mean, you know, what the, it's very enormous in, uh, in our profession. It was, and the, the other reason that we did this was because we just felt it's good to review contents periodically for lots of reasons, but primarily because of the place that these journals hold um, in scholarship for our profession. And in general, content analyses, uh, again, good to do from time to time because they primarily, they help to us to understand uh, trends that are happening in scholarship, uh, particularly as you look at it in, a, in an historical context. I mean, 1953 was, was a long time ago. And uh, I'm speaking to you as someone who was born in 1958. So <laughs> that's a long time ago. Uh, one of our colleagues, Steve Jinsky and his mentor, Chuck Schmidt, uh, give us this rationale that research activity is a primary indicator of the intellectual health and academic status of a field or discipline. And that is very true in music education. So we embarked on this content analysis. Pa some past analyses that have been completed in our field include uh, uh, sort of microscopic looks at music teacher education, original quantitative articles, that have been cited most frequently in these journals, uh, topical analyses, um, who participates in music education research. The primary content analysis that we ran across as we were doing our review of literature, however, was subject matter. Uh, that is, the, what, what was the primary focus for most of the music education uh, articles in those content analyses? So we used that as a foundation for what we wanted to do. Um, and we're looking at the I issue of the missing women. Now, for some of you, uh, this may not be a, an issue, right? Maybe where you are, uh, women in instrumental music education is, or, or maybe I should say uh, gender discrimination or gender bias in instrumental music education is a non-issue. Uh, and if that's the case for you, I, I, it, I would value that conversation. In the United States, however, we, we have seen uh, gender bias uh, in, in many ways in our profession. And of course, it, it leaks over into other prof professions as well. Why did we do this? Why did we take a look at, at this particular issue? Well, um, this idea has, has implications for rank and tenure and promotion in higher education, which of course has everything to do with how we support our families uh, and of course women being the carriers of the children and in most cases uh, as when we you look at research uh, women are deemed the primary caregivers although that's not true everywhere across the globe there is a disparity in attaining rank between men and women in the united states uh, we we discovered that through again through our literature review and also anecdotally um, and the other reason that we did this is that in studies that collected author data, none of them highlighted contributions of women. So we thought this might be a good thing to take a look at. 
Women contributing to music education research through the 1990s has outweighed women in leadership positions. And we thought that this was, was an interesting dichotomy that while women are contributing to music education research, capital M, capital E, like music education in total, uh, their, their visibility, women's visibility at the leadership positions do not, uh, do not match uh, what we are finding in the journals. And the other issue that we, we know here in the United States is that gender imbalance has been evident since the beginning of instrumental music education in the United States. And there are lots of reasons for that. You can go back to the, um, uh, to the development of instrumental music ed in the schools in the United States coming, coming out of a military background. Uh, and uh, it's been hard for women to shake that uh, in the, uh, over the decades. So, so there's, a, there's a real good, we think, a good groundwork for having done this work. Um, and so that leads us to the purpose. Uh, we, we know that gender bias is apparent in instrumental music. We also uh, have just discussed some of the challenges of research productivity that leads to, that, that is a contributing factor, factor to tenure and promotion in the United States. And again, maybe at our breakout sessions, we can talk about that piece as it relates to tenure and promotion in uh, universities, higher education around the world. And we also looked at the, um, the responsibilities of professional role models with the belief that if someone uh, of a certain race or gender is contributing to our, uh, our collective voice in research, that we end up being role models for those who we are teaching and we need to make sure that women are part of that discussion. So what did we do? Well, we, we took a look at, as I said in the beginning, all of the instrumental articles that uh, appeared in the JRME and the BCRME since their inception. What we found were 529 of those that occurred through both of those journals. In the JRME, there were 369. In the BCRME, 160. Now, you have to take into account that the, the bulletin uh, is, is 10 years younger than, um, than the JRME. So that might account for some of that disparity. There are other reasons uh, as well that we can uh, probably speculate on. Uh, we looked at uh, the year in which those, those articles were uh, published. We looked at issues of single and multiple authorship. Um, and again, I, I just want to underscore, we're looking at this as a snapshot, not, at, not to, to infer anything, but to give ourselves an idea about what we might think about in, in the, uh, the follow-up studies to these things. We looked at, obviously, author gender. Uh, we also looked at those who were publishing dissertations and theses. We looked at their methodologies. We pulled out the topics, and we also looked at participants' age and school level, although uh, that, uh, we, didn't, we didn't put a whole lot of emphasis on that. What we found? Uh, what we found was, uh, well, I should, I should uh, stop and say that we did use a gender binary system, and we could talk about the, uh, the benefits or the drawbacks of using a gender binary system. But that's what we decided to use for this study. And we found uh, 129 articles that were authored by women across both of these uh, publications. We also looked at high frequency publication. That was more than five articles by the same author. 25% uh, of, uh, of all the articles that were published uh, were high author, high frequency authors, totaled 16 of those 16 high frequency authors among males were 14 and only two females were high frequency publication uh, authors. And again, remember, we're talking about instrumental music here. This, um, this graph, I think, is very telling. If you take a look at the percentage of instrumental articles since the 1960s, uh, we decided not to, to include the 1950s because, uh, well, first of all, there were no <laughs> no women contributed in the 1950s. And also by including just the 1960s, we were able to go apples to apples with the JRME and the BCRME. So these are percentages, right? So 10% of all the instrumental articles were authored by women in the 60s. You go up to, to the 2010s, we had just under 30%. The highest percentage, uh, curiously enough, was in the 2000s, and then we experienced a drop, the lowest percentage in the 1970s. Again, we don't know why this occurred, but it is interesting to look at. Uh, in single authorship, um, 
we take we took a look at those who uh, not just single authorship but also uh, women. Right, single authorship from women outweighed multiple authorship in both journals. In other words, uh, people are writing by themselves. Uh, of the single papers authored by women, dissertation articles constituted 44% in the BCRME and 11% in the JRME. Those are raw numbers that you're looking at here on the slide. Uh, topics covered by female authors. This, this actually was pretty even across the board with uh, compared to men. There were a total of 47 discrete um, topics and, and Harry and, uh, and Mitch and I went back and forth on these, um, on these uh, topics to make sure that we were uh, in, in, we were congruent with each other uh, to make sure that each of these um, topics were, uh, we were catching the, the spirit of each of these topics within those articles. Uh, as you can see, most of the articles, as would be expected, have to do with curriculum instruction, pedagogy, teaching techniques, that kind of thing. The next thing down, which actually was quite distant from uh, the first one having to do with teaching, had to do with rehearsing and performance, and then, and then everything else fell below that with uh, the preponderance of the topics falling below 5%. So a smattering, one or two or three articles here, one or two or three articles there. And curiously enough, only 5.56% of the articles had to do with gender or gender instrument bias uh, that were covered by uh, female authors. Uh, research methods used by women. I thought this was terribly interesting. Um, of all the instrument articles written by women, right, most of them work quanti use quantitative methods. Only 23% use qualitative methods. We thought that was really uh, an interesting statistic. So what? So, uh, and I should say that we, there are a lot, there's a lot more data in the paper. You can take a look at that, but in the interest of time and giving you sort of the, our takeaways from this, uh, here are the things that we we gather from this. The emergence of female authors has been slow to grow since the, uh, since the 1950s. Uh, and the, that gender imbalance has widened in the past decade. Remember in the 2000s, uh, we had about 34% uh, contributions by female authors, but it has dipped down uh, last, uh, during the last decade. We're not quite sure why. Fewer women than men ended up publishing their dissertations. I think that's another curious uh, piece of information. And um, again, we don't know what has caused these, these trends to happen, but it gives us pause to think. Um, and it gives us pause to, to ask whether or not there might be gender bias in instrumental research, or if there are other things happening there that have to do with things going beyond uh, issues of bias. Again, like I've said a few times, uh, causes for disparity aren't obvious, but they do give us a, a, an opportunity to think about what we might ask in the, in the coming uh, uh, responses to this, to this research. In other fields, women are, this is, I should, should say that this was <laughs> really curious to me. When we looked at our, when we did work for our um, literature review, we found that women are more likely to engage in qualitative research in other fields even in other fields, in uh, other subfields in instrumental music education. So this was a curious thing for us. And instrumental research, quantitative research was prevalent for uh, men and women. Uh, just quick, thank you. Uh, do women encounter obstacles in the review process? That's something that maybe we should discuss. Uh, there are many of us on this call who perhaps have been on review uh, editorial boards, uh, editors of journals. Maybe we should take a look at that. Does it matter if there's blind review? Uh, do professional or personal issues influence research decisions? Are women more prone to or less prone to engage in the research process for, uh, for reasons that have to do with family? That was not shown to be the case in other areas uh, outside of music, but maybe the impact of workload and family are, uh, are, are contributing. Uh, what mentoring are, do, do women, young women in the profession in instrumental music receive? And what role does gender play in mentoring among young professors? And quickly, um, there are the high frequency repeating female authors in instrumental music were two. They are both on this call. I can, you, you can guess who they might be. Uh, challenges uh, that women historically faced in instrumental music performance, therefore, are also mirrored in scholarship. And, and that's not a good thing. I think we need to take a look at that. We need to ask why those disparities exist and mentors have to develop paths by which all scholars might 
succeed are necessary. And that's that. Thank you so much.